tropical. <laughs> no control over the weather in this room. Um, but welcome. We're so happy to see you. Happy after Thanksgiving and before all the other holidays that are coming up. I know it's a crazy time of year, so we're really happy to have you here. Uh, let me just remind you that uh, we welcome you to have your electronics on, but please put them on vibrate. Uh, feel free to tweet, take pictures. Facebook, anything you want during the event. Um, we, we just like it yeah. uh, quiet. Can we do you can do stuff. Right. I should do that. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, also, um, we have an event next Monday that is uh, listed on the back of your program. So if you're interested in that, there are still some seats available. Feel free oh, to email me in the office if you'd like to come. <laughs> social media. Right, right. If it's not on social media, it doesn't exist. <laughs> I'd like to remind you that if you do tweet, uh, please use at Dramatist Guild and hashtag new play so we can keep track of everything that's going on. And we also welcome questions from our online audience. Again, that's at Dramatist Guild, hashtag new play. We'll be having a the conversation for about an hour, and then when we're at an appropriate break, we'll open it up to questions. If you ask questions, please make sure you ask them loud enough so our online audience can hear it as well. All right? Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Christine Toy Johnson, who will be leading our conversation. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for being here, and, and I want to say thank you to our online audience, too. It's, it's kind of awesome that we're able to... Uh, be across the country and, and in this room at the same time. Uh, I wanted to, to open by telling you uh, why I had the idea for this panel. Um, it, it was, I have been uh, a lifelong actor. I started writing a, a good 20 years into my still ongoing acting career. <laughs> and I found that um, I was hitting these walls when I was applying for grants and fellowships at the beginning. Uh, because I was told, well, you can't be considered an emerging writer because of your long-standing career in the industry as an actor, which was very confusing to me. Um, and I met a, a lot of other people who were actually uh, experiencing similar things. And um, I started becoming curious about how we were all navigating this and how we might be able to find a new paradigm for uh, gathering our systems of support. So um, that's, that's sort of what started the idea for talk, for broadening the conversation. The, the Guild has certainly been a big system of support for me, and, and uh, that's why it made sense to, to be here. And uh, really grateful to Terry and Gary Garrison and, and all the people who've allowed this uh, conversation to come on. And, and they keep encouraging me to, to have these kinds of things. Um, and I also want to say from the top that none of this discussion is meant to be disparaging against people who found their voice early in life. <laughs> so let's just get that out of the way. Okay, thanks. Um, <laughs> and so I, I have this incredible group of friends and colleagues here that have, uh, have so much experience. I, you, you have their bios. I would never be able to remember everything they did, so I'm not going to try to tell you their bios, but I'm going to let each one of them um, introduce themselves and, and tell you a little bit about Emmy, about how they um, started writing and uh, how, how did we get to be here? Um, and uh, also, well, well, we'll start with this. Emily Morse yeah. is the artistic director of New Dramatists. Right. I'm going to just say this. Yes. Hunter Bell, of course, ac a writer, actor, Tony nominee. Human being. Human being. <laughs> Tim, Timothy Huang. Awesome writer, award-winning person. Everybody is human is being. Human being. Everyone's a human being. That's, that's so good. Okay, so um, <laughs> Emily, do you want to start just telling tell us a little bit about your life in the theater and how you uh, how you got to be where you are at New Dramas? Sure. Um, it's it's a pretty circuitous journey, but uh, I started as a performer, as um, I think many people do. Um, while I was in college, most of the performance opportunities I had and, and then continued to seek were actually in the dance department. And I was working with uh, very experimental creative choreographers who really engaged uh, their performers in the building of work. And so I often attribute that to my 
um, kind of first dramaturgical experience was how to work with a concept and and find a way to articulate a vision of, of an artist that I was working with. Um, simultaneously, uh, while I did not really pursue performance opportunities in the theater department, I did start directing um, in the theater department and sort of started to find a, a kind of richer voice in, in that particular practice. And I was fortunate at the time that I was at Temple University, there was a very new fledgling uh, playwriting course. And so I got involved with the playwrights uh, directing their work, working dynamically as they develop their work and finding workshop and, and, and kind of workshop production opportunities mm -hmm. with them. And so I really felt that that combination and that kind of confluence of experience with, between the dance department and working dynamically with, with playwrights is what led me to then pursue more opportunities in new play development. I worked at the Philadelphia Theater Company. I went from there to um, to Actors Theater of Louisville. I mean, I, I didn't go to graduate school because I couldn't figure out which <laughs> which thing I wanted to study. And so I thought it was a very expensive uh, proposition to not know what I wanted to master in. So I just continued to try to find practical opportunities to keep learning how to be a, a playwright advocate as a dramaturg, working in new play development, working in new play production. And so that's, so that, led me to a variety of things. Fast forward to the year 2000, I became a resident director at New Dramatists, and it was a place that I'd actually encountered as an intern at Actors Theater, and I thought, that's where I want to go. I love the mess of the, the d creative process, and um, so I pursued that, eventually became a resident director at New Dramatists, then became a literary coordinator, and from there had about 10 titles, this one being the most simple, actually, artistic <laughs> director, which I became uh, in July of this year after Todd London left. So Yay, thank, great, you. thank you. Um, we'll, we'll do the introductions first, and then I have some questions for, uh, for sure. all of you. Yeah. Uh, Who are you? <laughs> What's your name? I'm Hunter. Um, uh, I was uh, a performer first. I went to college at uh, Webster University, and I have a BFA in musical theater. And I came to the city as an actor, uh, audition, worked fortunately regionally a lot and I found that I liked rehearsal so much. I liked table work, I liked um, research, I liked pre-production, I liked thinking about all that stuff and I kind of you know cut my teeth like in high school and in college and after school doing um, great production things but Shakespeare and um, Summerstock Oklahoma and No No Nanette like sh established shows and every now and then I would start and have the luxury to maybe be part of a reading or a lab of a new work here in the city. And I would just say yes to that and you know, go in a room like this with a bunch of folding chairs and music stands. And I, a, a kind of a, a bulb went off that I loved that. Like I liked new work and you know, I kind of, I'm like, oh, you mean there, <laughs> there are new plays, there are new <laughs> musicals, and you can be a part of that process? So I liked being a part of that process as an actor, and I'd always written uh, and kind of <laughs> was a closet writer and never kind of would occasionally in college if an opportunity came to present in a directing class or something, oh, your own work. I jumped at that chance when I had it, but kind of got caught up in the middle of like, oh, I guess you just audition, and I just wanted to create more opportunities for myself, mm -hmm. and I wanted to be a part of the collective that determined what the conversation was. Mm -hmm. I just don't want to be reactive to. I didn't have a problem with people telling me what to do or where to stand. I enjoyed it very much. But I wanted that process to continue, and I wanted to be a part of that collaboration, mm -hmm. like in the making of something. And that's kind of where the transition happened. Uh, I wanted to make my own work. I wanted, it kind of came out of a response to, I'd see these new works, mm -hmm. and, I, and I write musicals, primarily. And I love musical theater, and instead of kind of kvetching about what I wasn't seeing, I was like, what if I took that energy right. and made the work I want to see, right. participate in it, instead of just bitching about what's not there, mm -hmm. then go make your own party. And so I did, yeah, yeah. Before we go to Tim, I want to know, um, 
What part did you play in No 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 No? I was an excellent ensemble member, and I <laughs> understudy. Tap I tapped. I played the ukulele too. Uh, now you know. I know you know. You could be a in Vegas. Special skills. <laughs> Uh, and then I think I understudied like three people, you know, with summer stock. <laughs> so, you know, if you were able bodied, then, and I love that show, P.S. I love that show. Come on, I have that album. Yes. Forget about it. I know. It. Well, I think we're similar. That'll be a separate panel show. that yes. we will hold about the value of no, we'll no, no, no. We'll talk about Seesaw, too. That's right. Come okay, on. Anyway. Um, <laughs> I confess I don't know what Seesaw is. But oh. I know. And while I'm, we're I'm being... I'm going to compose a really long email to you about the history of Seesaw. Please do. <laughs> it's a good show. Um, while we're being honest, I would say that I got to be here when I got here by a similar route to Hunter, except um, without half the success. <laughs> um, I'm just a very slow learner. And, and I think with the benefit of hindsight, I would say that I've always been a writer, and I just didn't always know it. So I did, I did college. I came to New York to do NYU with Bill Augustine um, in the mid to late 90s. Uh, got my bachelor's in musical theater um, and did a lot of new works uh, in the late 90s. Because, I, I mean, you could probably speak to this with even more authority, but back then I feel like the landscape was a little different if you, wanted to be a, if you, if you looked like we do oh, yeah, yeah. and wanted to have a life a professional life in theater. Um, and so my options were a little bit limited. Um, and to be perfectly honest, my ability was limited uh, as a performer. Uh, and so I wasn't always like getting those exceptions, people saying, oh, well, this is non-traditional, but that's, let's just overlook it. Because I, you, you gotta be able to bring that. You gotta be able to earn that, and that wasn't me. Um, and so consequently, I found myself being in a lot of things that were new and underwritten and underdeveloped and I kept thinking well I I can do I can do that I, I could probably do better than that um, and instead of like bitching about it I was like oh well maybe I should yeah. um, and so I went back to school uh, in the early aughts at NYU again for musical theater writing um, and for the last what 15 years I have been like slowly figuring out what what's that um, what's that that this American Life quote, the uh, uh, Ira Glass quote about making the gap smaller between what you want to do and, mm -hmm. and the ability, your ability to do it, just slowly kind of closing that gap, um, and and ever still, you know, is mm -hmm. how I'm here. The end. Uh, Emily, you and I were talking earlier about <clears throat> how New Dramatist has uh, opened its doors to hundreds of, of writers over the over the years, and. Writers of all different um, ages and experience, and uh, so I'm I'm curious about how New Dramatist has been able to really find what the needs are of of all of those writers, um, whether they're they're off the bus or mm -hmm. you know been around for a while, and uh, because I think that also that speaks to the idea of who's who's new. What does new mean? What does emerging mm -hmm. mean? Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, what you say is true. I mean, within our, um, both our current company, which is 50 playwrights, and then we have hundreds of alumni. I mean, I think that, um, you know, something I was thinking about with your question is that, you know, we, we simply offer playwrights time and space to develop their work, and we respond to the needs both individually and collectively. So it always, starts with listening to the playwright and what they need and helping them to articulate some of those needs and then providing the space and time for them to do that. But something I've been thinking a lot about recently is that there's absolutely the need for time and space to develop a play or to, de to develop a project. But I also think that time and space can be a place where writers cannot know. And so that's another, um, that they can use that time and space to follow impulses mm -hmm. that they have uh, to explore maybe a new way of working. And so there, th therein is the definition <coughs> of new. Mm -hmm. And we don't really use the terms emerging, um, established, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, mid-career is kind of a very yeah, broad, what does, yeah, yeah. what does that mean? But it sort of feels that, you know, when you're meeting a writer at, at any place in there, uh, they're a creative artist, mm -hmm. and so creative artists are, you know, there's impulses that they need to follow, and so our uh, mission and mandate is to support 
that exploration, you know, without any kind of expectation of, of outcome or because it, they'll follow their own impulses. They'll find their own way through right. things. And I think that goes across the boards for if you're 25, if you're 45, if you're 65. And that, that the ability to keep discovering and, and building your voice and building a company of collaborators, that takes time. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's always, we're always meeting them at that place mm -hmm. of what is it that you need? How can we support that? Who do you need in the room? How do we um, cast the audience? When does your work need to meet an audience? Because it's what you need at this moment in development of the project to know more to continue developing it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think it's simply, maybe this is to, just to listen to the writers and, and, and what they need and then figure out what kind of process can support that. And so that's across that's, the board. That's wonderful. And I think n New Dramas is, is a place that does not say in the application you have to have just uh, oh, yeah. come out of school yeah. or or something like that. No, there there are no there are no guidelines that I mean are the guidelines are simply what you submit right. for consideration the two plays a statement of purpose uh, and a bio or resume and right. that's simply um, what is the criteria yeah. to start with and then I don't know if you know this but how. Um, we put together a seven-person com uh, committee that changes completely every year. And so that committee is responsible for defining what is New Dramatist for them. What are their values as a committee? The staff facilitates the process, but we don't <coughs> participate in any decision-making. Right. And so, um, you know, there is no, you know, New Dramatist aesthetic or there is no New Dramatist uh, kind of prevailing as right, anything. Right. It's, it's really just about what that committee can determine by consensus. And so um, there's no input from us about even you know slots. It's not about slots. It's about the group. It's about the passion of the committee for the for the group that they're bringing in. So the moral of the story is keep trying. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> keep applying. Keep Absolutely. Trying, right? Absolutely. I, yeah. I mean, I say to people, and I, t I know it's, it's very challenging, but it's, you never know when you're going to meet your committee. Right. And the committee, the, the, and I've seen it. I've, done, I've facilitated the process with you know, Todd, uh, my predecessor, and um, for 12 years. And it's remarkable to sit in a room and see how different people can read plays or how differently they respond based on, you know, that is a subjective process. This, the subjectivity is mitigated by the fact that it's consensus-based decision and that's part of what they uh, are, are wrestling with is how to make those determinations. Many, many, many good, great, talented writers don't make it. I mean, we in in a particular year we get 500 applications. We take between five and eight. Those are pretty ah. stark. It's yeah. a pretty stark ratio. So yeah. we always <laughs> say there's no reason not to apply. There, you know, as long as you whatever your threshold is for the waiting and the the well, the waiting yeah. is yeah. largely uh, it. So. Thank you. Yeah. Um, do either of you guys have um, stories about uh, you know? Getting to that odd crossroads of not being when you started out, not really being emerging in the traditional sense, but uh, needing to find places to be and 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 spread your wings a little bit. Uh, yeah, very much so. Well, the, I, one thing I want to respond to, but uh, maybe part answer, you have to apply. Like you, you got to buy a lotto ticket if you want to win the lottery, right, right. and so you can't. I find it a lot of times it's an easier excuse to stand it outside, and those applications can be seem like a bear. You know, sometimes I'm like, oh, it's like doing my taxes, or you know, mm -hmm. and I'm like, but if you want in the game, go for it. You know, and I just I I, I have to check myself and my ego like sometimes with that. And I have still applied to everything and I have a huge bin of rejection letters and I'm sure I'll get another <laughs> slew of them. And I'm doing okay, you know? Yeah. And I still get rejected from uh, lots of things for any number of reasons. Um, from not being emerging to right. maybe now to commercial to uh, it not being good enough or accept a panel, you know, it's all in the right. eye of the beholder. But I apply to everything mm. every year, awards, grants, everything. Yeah, and um, 
and maybe my number will come up, or maybe it won't. But that is the first thing to do, I think, mm -hmm. is I honestly have to check Megan and be like, well, mm -hmm. right. girl, this is five pages too far. And I'm like, get over yourself, dude, and like, just get in the game, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. And so that is a, that was a lesson for me to actually like calm myself down <laughs> and be like, it's part, it's part of it, you know? It's part of it, and I have to respect those things. And I have gotten countless rejections and we'll get countless more. And mm -hmm. I kind of wear it as like a badge of honor. <laughs> and I've been turned down from things. And I, you know, I you get this, the letter and I'm like, oh, this is a little thin. This probably won't go like, dear <laughs> sir, we, <laughs> we, sir, we thank you for, there have been so many wonderful applications. I was You're, like, yeah, okay, yeah. great. <laughs> and I, and it is weird. And a lot of those two, I even, when it says like, seeking to merge you only, I still go for it. Really? Why not? I was like, then I'll, it's in the bin because maybe it'll slip through somehow. But I still do, even though, I mean, if it's a specific age range or something, I'll honor that. But some of these grants and things, I'll, I'm like, oh, I guess I'm still emerging in my own mind. <laughs> you know, I'm like, and I respect if they don't believe that or not, but I go for it. I yeah, go for it. You. And I still hit that wall, that weird wall, too, of I've been very grateful I have a lot of commercial success, and I'm doing okay. And, uh, but I'm not... I have got a mansion, you know, and there are months that are like this, and there are projects that need help, too. So I'm always applying for grants and always trying to just put my name out there yeah. um, to see what can come back. Because you know what? A, a $500 grant is $500. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A $250 yeah. grant mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. will go buy you some paper and some ink, yeah. and it, it is something. And also it's something for the resume too, you right. know? And it's out there, and I, I do feel like it is our responsibility, or I'll, I'll do it for myself first, to participate in that. Um, no matter what level you're at, the phone doesn't necessarily magically ring, and it's our responsibility yeah. to participate in it. Yeah, I, I uh, I'm sort of refer to myself sometimes as grant girl, because yeah. I, I decided at one point, I think, to just embrace what I, my experience, and uh, because it's it's hard one, and um, and yeah. I actually I think since 2007 is the first grant I applied for, and s in seven years I've received something like 15 competitive grants to support my awesome. my writing work. So that's kind of great. But I think it's all part of it is just saying uh, I believe in this project. I believe in what I have to say, yeah, yeah. and instead of just saying. Um, okay, well, nobody's saying that I'm in this category. Um, I'm going to m make my own way. Yeah. Um, how about you, Tim? Well, I actually, I, again, I'm, I'm sorry to be repetitive, but I'm going to echo a lot of Hunter's sen uh, sentiments because that's what it boiled down to for me, too, is every time you apply for something, every time I would apply for something, it would always be about, well, d does my ego allow for me, like, does my own humility allow for me to consider that I'm, I'm in a category, like, or, or does, is my unwillingness to apply really just about my own sense of value? Um, but to, gi to, to give a direct example to answer your question is, um, and you know this, five days ago, five, six days ago, I celebrated my 40th birthday. I was a Dramatist Guild fellow two years ago. Mm -hmm. Two years ago. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting in this very room with some of the next generation's most talented minds. And it was a very surreal experience for me. Because on the mm -hmm. one hand, it's like, wow, I am so much older than these people. And then on the other hand, it's like, wow, I finally get to be with, at the table. You know? yeah, yeah. Um, and and it, was a real, it was a real touchstone for me just because like all this time, it's like, oh, well, well may, may, maybe, it's, maybe what's prevented you from getting there in the, in the past has always just been your feeling that you should have been there before. Mm. When, you know, which is kind of really sick, like, <laughs> twisted. It, it, you know, as creative artists, we all, we all have that impulse to be like, well, I, I have something of value and something important to say, and therefore it lends me credibility. But then suddenly, when we're juxtaposed with all these other people that, that seem to be, like, doing, doing things that other people like, you know, and like it, it was just very like, oh, okay, so maybe this is just where I belong, and I'm very happy to to do that. Um, but it's it's always just been about like whenever I whenever I am career minded, I find that I hit more walls. But whenever mm -hmm. I am more mindful of my art and improving my art, then like 
whatever those walls are, they're, they're actually just like lessons in disguise, you know? Um, I'm gonna I, put that on a pillow. Oh, oh, like, somebody really stitched that on a sandwich. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that that's yeah. the part of the frustration, exactly that, that we think that the career, a career, or how you build a career follows the chronology of age or, you know, chronology of time. And I think that that's exactly where these terms can be really frustrating because, as you've said, that, you know, creative artists, path is not linear. It's, it's often not, right. more often than not. And right. as you've talked about, that you at some point have a strong impulse to write and follow that because at some point you, your voice is emerging right. for that yeah. particular, right. that that's what, what is expressing your voice at that time. And um, so anyway, that's all. I just, that, yeah. it, that both of you, the way you sort of talk even about your career is that it doesn't, you don't hit emerging and then stay. I mean, people's, it, it, yeah, it, 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 it's this. It, it, it is this. But I agree with that of like it is, and I do want the pillar of that. <laughs> it, it kind of, you have some choices. I can be mad that a, a 25 year old writing team got something that I didn't, or I can go make my art and yeah. just continue to create. I know it sounds a little zen and a little easier, uh, and a little easy, or maybe easier said than done. We're entitled to have emotions and jealousy I, I, on all that, but at what point do you just stay stuck in that, mm -hmm. and at what point do you continue to make what you want to make and keep putting it out yeah. in the world? Mm -hmm. And and I always think my path is interesting too because. Even when I got rejected, I just went and got in a room with my friends and put up folding chairs. And I, I was not handed a magic key either. And sometimes I use the not getting into things to fuel and figure mm -hmm. out how to make my own party. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, all right, I'm not going to get, I didn't get into this, I didn't get into this, I didn't get into this. But I can rent this space. Right. <laughs> and, I'll, and I worked my day job and wrote a play at mm -hmm. night and then went and performed that play down at Manhattan Theater Source, which is yeah. sadly no more, oh, yeah. for in a room this size with just as many chairs to 10 people. And I, I kid you not when I felt like a rock star. Mm -hmm. So that's, I was learning lessons in self-producing. I was learning Absolutely. lessons in putting my art out there and I thought it had value. And from that became a little more confident, a little more, so that was all part of that. I didn't let the not getting into things or being jealous that people, they came to it in their own time, mm -hmm. you know, and I, we come to it our own time. Mm -hmm. So I think we have a choice with it, yeah. Uh, we've been talking about the, um, this, I hope you've read this issue, this month's issue of The Dramatist because it's one of my favorite issues ever. Mm -hmm. I got it. it. It's like gold to me. Yeah, and so Oops. there, there's this, there's this, um, <laughs> article right in the beginning by Douglas Post. It's called um, Emerging Established and Dead. <laughs> and uh, that, he said, it refers to the three stages of a playwright. So <laughs> and and, um, and he, he talks about the idea of getting rid of those labels, you know, just saying we're playwrights. Let's just say that. But I'm, I wonder if you, you guys have any, um, any ideas. This is such a, this is a broad question, but how we could expand the definition of, of all of those things. Well, maybe not dead, but um, expanding the definitions <laughs> mm -hmm. so that we might, I, I don't know about you, but I, I love this kind of dialogue because it makes me feel like, oh good, I'm not alone. You yeah. know, I've, I've, I, you're thinking similar things. But um, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, one thing I'll jump out and say is what's interesting, even when I read this too, and I remember like when I first got in the guild, I would read this and I would, I'll check myself, be honest, like I would be jealous of the people there and I'm like, they got it all figured out. And so it's helpful to, I agree with you, like, I don't wanna say like Ziggy cartoon, <laughs> misery loves company, it's not misery, <laughs> but it's, I think a lot of the show business part, not necessarily into this room and for this, but what is sold is Cinderella stories or like little quick blurbs right. of like, even I found myself of like overnight success. I'm like, I worked a day job for 15 yeah. years and I wrote that play mm -hmm. barring ink and paper from my boss. Don't tell. Um, <laughs> and, but you know, a lot of times in a, like a sound bite, it'll be like or a, a meteoric rise or whatever. Right. I'm like, so it spins and it can mess with the creative, it, it puts a rift, I think, and makes it kind of us and them yeah. when that's just BS and we're all just trying to get through the day. And what's my point? My point is to demystify that, and yeah. I agree with you that sometimes it's helpful just to have the conversation, mm -hmm. be like, oh good, I'm not the only one who wants to bang my head against the wall or feels like this will never happen, right. you know? Right. That was just tangent, sorry, on the no, question. Okay. Um, 
Um, and I think I forgot the initial question. Oh, so I was just talking about trying to maybe expand the definition, or, or I don't know. That's that's such a. Oh, uh, that, but that's what it was. Like that. Question. That the first thing is demystifying and having this conversation is why I appreciated this and seeing really respected writers who are commercially successful or really critically successful or won a Pulitzer or something or won a Genius Grant and they're struggling with it too, man. Right, and right. they are going through the muck too and they had a good year and won a Pulitzer and then they're ba back, back, back facing the blank page too. Right. Mm -hmm. And I take heart in that. Mm -hmm. Like that makes me feel a little less alone somehow. Right, right. And I guess it ties into merging of just like, oh good, Christopher Shin's emerging too. Yeah. Like he's trying to write, <laughs> he's trying to write a new play, and so he's emerging. Or he didn't get produced of this thing, so he's having the same moment like we all had to. So it just redefines it a little bit. Yeah. I had here's a name drop. I had a great conversation with John Kander one time, and I respected him so much. And after I got through my starstruckness, I appreciate like that dude's like Chicago's on Broadway. Yeah. And he's down like working on the landing at the venue, you know, like he's still trying his art and trying to make stuff and still n nobody's like, we got to produce the landing on Broadway immediately. Like he's like, anybody want to do the landing and thank God for like the vineyard and non-for-profit mm -hmm. who will take an emerging play from John Kander, you know, so that's that thing like he is as established in history and commercial success too, that plays emerging too. So I take comfort in that and kind of just like reprogram my head. I'm like, that dude's emerging too, you know? Yeah. I don't know, maybe no, I'm no, a little Jedi mind trick I play on myself, no, but I think, no, it, I think it's we, true. Yeah, we can we can have a whole conversation about how you should just, if you're feeling vulnerable at all, stay away from Facebook. Uh, <laughs> 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 my favorite thing is when like a twenty-year-old says, "I've been dreaming about this my entire life." It's like, yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I digress. Um, <laughs> That's right. Tim. Yes. What is your? Let's go back to the, my my uh, idea about the issue about about what your idea of um, success and failure is, is is pertains to what we've been talking about. I have so many thoughts about this, and most of them are not very popular. So I'm going to try and <laughs> honestly, I'm just trying the, to keep it real. The Twitter sphere is just going to be yeah, crazy. I, I, I will <laughs> try to, to, to temper it as much as possible. Um, but like, I think for me, a successful day is when I don't roll my eyes when somebody asks me, "Oh, you're a writer? Are, like, are you on Broadway?" Uh, and then, because it, because nobody gains anything by me doing that. Right. Nobody understands anymore that there's a commercial theater, there's an artistic theater, there's political theater. Uh, and, and nobody, nobody learns that uh, you know, Broadway is predominantly theater for the rest of the country. And like, no, <laughs> nobody learns anything when you say, uh. uh so I think that for me, like, a successful day is when I'm able to like, check that attitude and be like, no, I'm not. I really want to get there. I really want to get there. And here's, here's a couple of things that you know, some people talk about that, that I have done that you wouldn't know, and that's okay. Um, and, and, you know, and, no, and, and maybe, maybe after this conversation, you'll like Google me, and you'll want to, you'll go and you'll, you'll find my SoundCloud, or you'll, you'll find, you know, my 10-year-old cast album with a view from here available on iTunes and Amazon.com. Um, <laughs> like, and maybe you'll download it. Uh, yeah. so, so that's like, I think my personal goal is mm -hmm. to someday be at a place where it's never, I, I never cower in shame when somebody says, have you written anything on Broadway? And I have to say right. no. You because the it, truth you is, own it, what, yeah, what, you do, yeah. what you have done, and, and what you are doing. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so that's one way th th to look at it, mm -hmm. you know, which maybe I should probably stop there, Hunter. <laughs> no, I love that. Uh, six, um, well, I'll, I'll speak on panels, too, and people say, like, do you feel successful? And I'm like, <laughs> well, uh, how much time you got? And uh, <laughs> I always ask, well, what do you mean? You know, because there's financially successful, there's creatively successful, there's romantically successful. There, you know, there's all these different kind of parts of our lives as human beings and artists. And I'm like, ask me every hour to the hour and get a different. <laughs> and you know, sometimes I'll get a few pages out, and I'm like. I got this, I'm amazing. And then an hour later, I'm like, what am I doing? I got nothing. <laughs> and I'm terrible at this. I'm like, I'm amazing, I'm terrible. You know, like, so I was like, that's probably a common theme. Um, but I wonder also, do you find that being, being more mature than 
than you were 20 years ago, I'll just say it that way, um, do you find that it's easier for you to recognize that? Absolutely. So that you can say, Absolutely. oh, I'm being like this. I was amazing Absolutely. five minutes ago. Yeah, and, or, 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 <laughs> I, yeah, and also to just to, to, to speak to what to have a, a little bit better understanding of those differences, like you mentioned, of a commercial, of nonprofit, of, uh, of what all that kind of means and what it means for us as artists mm -hmm. and as writers and um, just a little more awareness, a little bit more awareness of that um, is helpful, I think. It's helpful for me, at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and the success, um, I don't, well, first of all, I, I mean, not to be too zen or, um, but I, I'm like, I come from a place of gratitude. So I'm like, if we're in this room having this and we have clothes and we're, we're way ahead of the game, you know, mm -hmm. it's like not to poo poo any of that, but it was like, we're doing all right in here, you know? Mm -hmm. So I checked that box, um, like we're well fed, <laughs> we're not in the rain, check. And I do kind of remind myself of those things too, of like, and that comes with a little bit of age yeah. of like some gratitude. I got some health, I have an ability to write to, and that, that has come like with age and just kind of challenging what my goals are a little bit too. That, that's an interesting, uh, yeah. yeah, I'm gonna come back to that, but yeah. Emily, I wanna ask you the same question about uh, what, what do you consider to be success for you? For me, mm -hmm. personally? Yeah. Uh, wow. Um, that's a really hard question to um, to answer. I don't. Wow. I think that something I've been thinking about recently um, is that, in a way, where I am now, and and it has a lot to do with arriving at New Dramatis, um, which to me is a place where this varied background that I have is actually all relevant mm -hmm. and, and pertinent and it continues to be built upon and expanded um, is that you know I sort of had this moment where I thought th this is, I'm actually living my dream yeah. I mean it, it's not maybe exactly what the 12 year old right. imagined because that involved Broadway tap dancing and all the <laughs> things that I did too <laughs> um, but this sort of notion of, of, of living uh, within an artistic community that is so vibrant and diverse and eclectic and constantly, um, you know, growing and changing and, and experimenting and collaborating, to me, those that uh, that richness uh, and, and living an artistic life and um, being healthy and you know raising a child um, also in that community where he has access to um, such incredibly creative, thoughtful, um, passionate people to me is success, mm -hmm. you know, and to be able to live an artistic life, I think, and, and within an artistic community. Uh, I think that uh, I sort of had that kind of stunning moment where I thought, wow, this is kind of living my dream. That's amazing. Um, but it has everything to do with the community that I work in. Yeah. And I feel that one of the things I wanted to, to sort of say about the, the, this also, the thing about emerging is that w to be emerged has so much to do with the productions you've had or level of productions. And I think that's also problematic because what is being produced is not necessarily representative of what is being written. There's a whole, right. again, right large community of varied and um, yeah. diverse writers that you're that are not necessarily right. seeing their work on on stage and so I think that that's also problematic because it also sets up that success is related to production right. and right. then yeah. level of production and um, and so I think that that's also just something I wanted to say yeah. about um, that I think to be able to create on your own terms and in, in, in the company of people that you choose to work with mm -hmm. uh, is successful. It feels that to be able to make work on your own terms and finding the ways to keep that integrity as an artist and then hope, you know, I think that there's, there's something energetically that happens as a result of that confluence that moves things forward, whether it's to 
to re discover things about your own voice that um, that I, I hope can is part of how people define success because I think that that the production using production is so elusive. You can right. have a right. production, you can have two or three productions, and then you don't. Right. And so then you're on this constant fluctuating uh, roller coaster of I'm successful, <laughs> I'm not. Yeah. I, you know, <laughs> right, right. Um, you you have to. It has to. It, I mean, and the, that's the first. It has to yeah. come from an internal place because the the business is just fluctuates so much and yeah. it changes so much and it's so much in the hands of other people and decisions. Yeah, I, I, and I, always, like I always say that show business is impossible at best. <laughs> and um, and um, so, yeah, I think that we all have, we all have to reinvent ourselves every six or seven minutes um, or uh, uh, redefining Goals, not to say to to settle for something that you don't want, but um, figuring out, like you said, I think that's a great way to put it. Having it on your own terms, so you're ha embracing your life in the theater, and and I I think very often for all, I, I I'm sure if I asked you the same question about what you thought you might want to have be happening now, as opposed to what has happened and how how it's. Uh, New dreams have come true. I'm sure the way the more you uh, or live your life. Do you do either of you have a? Yeah. Well, uh, I'm actually thinking about something that yeah. Emily was talking about earlier. Uh, just uh, what you mentioned about uh, the having to reinvent ourselves. I think I think it, it's helpful for me to remind myself that the business that we're in or the art form that we're in is by definition ethereal, and as a result, what happens is audiences are constantly changing. Um, people who go to plays, the, the median age changes from generation to generation. And so it's, it's easy in the digital age where everything is preserved to think that someone who has accomplished X, Y, and Z shouldn't be emerging or, or, or mm -hmm. should be established because of their body of work, mm -hmm. whereas like, it's not necessarily fair because maybe that, like, that was a different audience, that was a different generation. Like, mm. Do you know? That's um, an interesting yeah. point of view, yeah. And, and I feel like to speak sort of indirectly to your question, um, recognizing that that changes allows me to, uh, I'm a very kind of closed circuit sort of person, like I like the things in boxes and you know, working on that, work in progress. But like, <laughs> it allows me to say, oh, like dreams can change and goals can mm -hmm. shift. And, and it also, just tangentially, mm -hmm. um, allows me to appreciate other people's work in a way that I never was able to before mm -hmm. because I'm suddenly not like, Comparing all the mm -hmm. time, you know. Mm -hmm. I maybe should be quiet. No, that's no, a good I trick. That. I don't know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, let's be honest. That's that's a that's a very that's very mature of you. I think that's great. No, <laughs> thank you. I am, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm very I'm proud of that. Serious. No, I, I am being serious. I think that it's a very difficult thing for for anybody in in the arts not to compare themselves and not to measure, try to keep measuring. So, um, yeah, bless you. Um, Hunter? I well, I, I I'm always shocked of how <laughs> uh, well, I got on this panel <laughs> of, how, uh, uh, of how I got to how be I where it is, and it go does go back to. I do think I mean some of it is luck, some of it is timing. There's those are those elements, but I do believe at the core of it, mm -hmm. I wanted to say something and it kind of yeah, like yeah. I, there is like the the closer I kind of tried to stay to a personal truth or an aesthetic or not veer from who once I kind of figured out and liked who I was and liked what I wanted to say and leaned into it yeah then things started happening and so I am a big fan of that a little bit it doesn't always look like what you think it's going to look right, like, exactly and right. it always manifests itself in a lot of surprising ways. And and I have struggled and tempted and done every kind of job and had a really strange route to um, becoming a writer, but so does everybody. You know what I'm saying? Like nobody, <laughs> like that's what I kind of figure out too. Nobody, I would make up in my head of like, I bet this person had this experience. And then you kind of talk to them and you're like, oh, they had a crazy mm -hmm. route too. Yeah. And it was just that's comparing. I made up in my mind what other people's 
experience was, and everybody is unique. But the when I kind of would try and at least stick to what I my own idiosyncratic voice Absolutely. and not imitate or emulate, but just kind of stay true to that. Every now and then, some some of these great adventures I've had would reveal themselves, and when I veered from that. They didn't always. Mm -hmm. Now that's a little bit of an overgeneralization, but I kind of believe that. Mm -hmm. I believe that in a, it, from an artistic place. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 You can only write what you can, you know, you can on. Write what you can you, write. Yeah. 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 And and I can only write that later in life to, to emerge. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't kind of had that body of experience, nor the megaphone, or the wherewithal to say what I wanted to say or the guts or the balls or the creativity to say it when I was 20 necessarily. It had yeah. to happen much later in life. Yeah. The, can I, the, yes. Just about, this, did you um, and anyone see that there was the American Masters um, series that's on public television and it was the, you, the one about Eugene O'Neill? I don't know if anybody see it. see it. It's no. kind of remarkable because it speaks to exactly yeah. what you were just saying and that, you know, he wrote the, the Tyrone family plays, you know, when he was 50 or over 50, yeah. wow, you know, yeah. and so that idea that, you know, that he had been writing plays obviously prior to that, but um, really sat down and wrestled with the, the, those demons when he was older and had yeah. the maturity or wherewithal or need or, and skill to kind of put it all together and make those plays. It, I, I found it absolutely inspiring on so many levels and fascinating. So I, I yeah. recommend it because I think that's something too is that you you keep making your work through all of your years and then there's also something that is uh, the kind of accumulation of knowledge about your voice trust right. confidence yeah. maturity right. even if you're still struggling with the how and the what you know that there you do have that to sit with you when you're looking at that blank screen or blank paper or how, however that right. um, I don't That's know, great. Allows oh, those open you. those channels to open because uh, I don't know. I think about that a lot. Yeah. Well, think. because there, you know, there's so much ageism everywhere. Mm -hmm. So it is one of the one of the pieces of the puzzle of just navigating your mm -hmm. way through through all of this. Um, so I appreciate that. And also the trust I think that you gain internally of saying, no, I I think this is going to work. You just have to trust me. Mm -hmm. Right. While I struggle through, and that's harder to do when I think when you're younger because you don't know. Exactly, you're figuring it out, and so I see that too. With especially, you know, writers who are creators or, or theater makers that have um, had to kind of uh, create their own opportunities. That at some point, that it's, it can be very empowering because they know how to make their work, right. even when it's murky, and uh, you know. And so there's something to be gained through that your own um, experimentation and success and failures and learning from that. Yeah, you, you know, we we talked about creating your own opportunities a little bit. Tim, what what do you uh, what do you want to add to that conversation? I don't know that I I don't know that I'm the most qualified to to, to add anything. Honestly, um, I I'm in in awe of the way you do it, uh. and always grateful to be included <laughs> when you do it. Um, but I I think that by and large, like I have been successful at it when uh, it hasn't been about me. Again, like it, when it's been about, and you said this earlier, oh, this project really needs, like I really believe in this. This is something I really want. Uh, I find that people uh, respond to that more and then lend support more easily than when it's like, oh, I'm unemployed and bored right now. Let's do something so that I can, you know, not be angry on Facebook or whatever it is. <laughs> uh, um, but I mean, I, I guess I can say that, um, I crowdfunded a, a reading, right. uh, which I thought uh, we all. I, I'm going to say this about crowdfunding, and then maybe maybe it won't be relevant, and maybe we can move on. But I feel like um, it was probably one of the hardest things I've ever had to do, and I think that there's this notion that you post a project online, and then uh, the internet gives you magic money, <laughs> uh, and you don't have to do anything. <laughs> and 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 maybe that's actually maybe maybe that works that way for some people. It didn't for me. Well, I, I did a um, forecast album. It was a full time job. It was, it was a, a it's full -time a full time job. job. And, um, and I was happy to do it. But it's yeah. yeah no, please. No, it was just that. It was it was 
constantly trying to think creative ways to stay engaged, to raise that money. I'm glad I did it, but it was a full-time job. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, it's, it's almost as hard as the act of creating the art itself. Uh, right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's true, because you don't want to bombard people with links to your project, but at the same time, you don't want them to forget about it either. So you have to really think about what it is that they want or what it is what what incentivizes them to, which is hello isn't that what we're trying to do with our own work too like oh oh learning experience this is good this is good um but i i found that like the the minute it was it it, became, it was about the project the minute it, it really does become about the work uh things start to make a lot more sense um, and, and to that I would say that like, even though it was the hardest thing I've ever had to do, I would do it again in a heartbeat if it was something that I really like, cared about. Right. I think I had this revelation the other day and I realized that I often say I am my own intern, borrowing from, from Doug Wright, but um, <laughs> I, I also, I, I had this light bulb went off and I thought, ah, ah, I am my own <coughs> nonprofit organization. Yeah. I must stay true to my mission. If I can stay true to my personal and artistic mission, then like you said, it's, it's, it, Th things get easier yeah. and more difficult, but in a good way. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yeah. I, I, I think that's perfectly said that it gets, some things are easier. I work, uh, I'm fortunate to have representation and have had opportunities, and I <coughs> work just as hard and I'm just as roller coaster y, but maybe even harder. Um, at times on things, I constantly feel like I'm still self-producing even when I'm produced mm -hmm. because I'm just trying to figure out opportunities and ways to get something out there um, mm -hmm. and or be a part of something or a, a project. So, yeah, I, 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 I like what you said about it gets easier and harder, <laughs> you know. So I, certainly with some success, some more doors open a little bit, but sometimes not really. Mm -hmm. Not really. So I keep knocking and banging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, if I just uh, piggyback on that, uh, I, I I should probably disclose that after I successfully funded this this project, uh, the the piece that I was working on was then like two very very large doors open that I had absolutely no control of because people were like, oh, like this guy's not messing around. Like he's really this this bears my consideration. Like people with real power and influence were saying, oh, this bears consideration, um, but it was only because I, was li I literally said, draw any hoop, I'll jump through it, y you know. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, Suck your neck out. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. which is, come on, go big or go home. If you, if you don't believe right. in it that much anyway, then you probably shouldn't right. be doing it, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but it did, it did open up a lot of things and made things a little bit easier, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I, I, I find that all the time, too, in self-producing of, I was example, we, I didn't know what was going to happen with our project, and we started at Manhattan Theater Source, and it was 12 people, and you have a couple choices to be like, oh, only 12 people came, or like, 12 people came, and I'm doing my show in New York, yeah. so how do you, how, again, I offer that thing of, what is your mindset around it, and it becomes a little half full, half empty, but, uh, and they're not always easy choices to make. But the more you can kind of just continue to make your work, continue to put it out there, <laughs> keep putting it out there, keep putting it out there, keep putting it out there. I don't know. I, I believe sometimes if you continue to believe in it, some path will reveal itself. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. To go back to the how do we define, uh, what is it, uh, emerging, established, and dead, <laughs> like one of the <laughs> less popular things that was going in my head in terms of how to de define somebody that's established mm -hmm. is who's perpetually putting the stuff out there. Like I was actually, if I can sort of name drop, I was thinking about one of your collaborators, our friend Michael Mott, who's like 18 and a genius and beautiful and lovely, <laughs> just constantly putting stuff out there, constantly putting stuff out there. He's and actually I'm, 29. Oh, he's 29? Yeah. Oh, okay, he's very, very young for 29. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I look at the way he, he's constantly generating work and, 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 and putting it all out there and meeting people and still supporting us and, and his community. And, I, and I, I'm so not only impressed, but also very like, uh, attracted to that. I find that mm -hmm. to be a very valuable lesson, a very valuable model. Um, and, I, and I wish, like in a perfect world, we could define established by people who are still willing to just do it and mm -hmm. do it and do it again and do it again and do it again and do it again. 
you know. Um, yeah, I, it, that's an interesting thing that, that maybe this conversation is more about how do you define established because like Emily said, it, it, to equate it to productions isn't really necessarily a, a, a reasonable thing to do, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, or in any kind of linear fashion yeah. that you were emerged and then you emerge right. and then you're established and I mean, I and think. And then you're dead. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I think you're, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, I mean, Terry, how are we doing for uh, questions? Do, do we have questions? I don't have any yet. You don't have any yet? Do we have any questions in the room? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I mean, all of this is wonderful, but <coughs> I think the one thing that concerns me at this point in my life and lifetime is, and I'm going to guess, but I, well, I can always speak for myself, I'm going to guess that there's some overlap with other people here. The practicality of not just putting out work, but of going to the next step, getting, trying to get notice and recognition for that. And I understand this additional process and things that we can make it. But some of the frustrations that I encounter are things like, um, I don't expect you to press a button and solve this, but uh, there are, of course, many organizations that won't accept any unsolicited work something uh, unless you have agent representation mm -hmm. or they only take 10 pages. And, you know, I go along with that. But um, um, frankly, I'm sure you can debate this on the one. I don't think you can judge a work in 10 pages. I, I, think you can, okay. this, I think you can evaluate very poor writing. So this is very poor. <laughs> mm -hmm. and this, this is, mm -hmm. But I don't think you can take 10 pages and an 80 page play and I don't really know if people would ever play by 10 pages, but that's an obstacle we all have to deal with. Uh, I said, what I'm asking you is, <laughs> are any uh, tips, yeah. ideas, or whatever, not for getting around the process, but for get, throwing our work out into a broader net, not just for the companies or the theaters that are going to take you know, 10 pages unsolicited. Or, you know, whatever, and I don't want to monopolize the time, but you know, I, there's a lot of related questions here, too. But what do we have to do to get to the gatekeeper? Mm. Because until we get past the gatekeeper, we've got nothing. Mm. We have our own work, and we can, we can maybe be pretty good and confident of our accomplishments. Uh, but until we get past the gatekeeper, we've got nothing. And if, if I may ask him, you mentioned before, you get 500 plus or minus uh, submissions or applications right. and you might take five weeks. How welcoming are your, your organization and comparable organizations to people who, let's face it, may be you know, over 50 years old, but who are writing mm -hmm. frequently and often? Mm -hmm. uh, are you going to say, well, we should invest more in people who are 20 or 30 because they've got 8 or 10 or 12 or 15 plays left in them. Whereas if you take someone who's 55 or 58 or 60, you know, it may be a, uh, you know, flash in the pan or one time on mm. right. So to that point, that, that never comes up in conversation. I mean, the, someone's age is truly irrelevant in the process, as is awards, other opportunities, productions, those, the, 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 we have three meetings um, where the, the seven person committee comes uh, to New Dramatist. They l can last between 12 and 15 hours where the work wow. is discussed um, and they winnow the list. So they actually talk about the work the, and the applicants and um, and it's all focused on the merit of the work as they respond to it. So things like candidacy, things like pl status of career, how many productions someone has, how many awards they've received, none of that comes into the decision-making process. It is all about the merit of the work as they respond to it, and then um, how they arrive at consensus amongst the seven people to move certain people forward. And then they have a second meeting where they do the same, and then a final meeting where um, they, uh, that's the meeting where they actually determine who the incoming f five to eight writers are. So really the, 
two full meetings and half of the second are all focused on the merit of the work and their response to the merit of the work or the, pa the, the passion they have for the voices that are, um, that they're, that are being discussed. And so I think it's very welcoming. In fact, you know, that's part of it. It's a very open process. Uh, I, I just want to make just a clarification. Prior to going paperless, we were averaging about 350 applications. When we went paperless two years ago, three years ago, was when we spiked up to, we had 536 and this year, um, wow. uh, you know, in the upper 400. So I just want to make that clear. <laughs> we thought 350 was a lot, but then, <laughs> you know. So anyway, I just want to say that it's very welcoming. Those factors are not actually part of the decision making ever. Um, it's really the passion for the voices and um, as they determine it amongst themselves and what they value and in writing and for theater as it is as an art form and the future of it. So I would say it's pretty welcoming. And I, I would say that within the community, certainly during my time, you know, the age range has been, you know, late 20s to mid 60s and so it's and that's just it has been I mean it's um yeah I have a, I have a, a response to it um I think you have to self-produce and you might say what do you mean by that but I offered to you too I'm like um I don't know what anybody's situation specifically but have you like exhausted possibilities for the work to get out there and have you exhausted it again and have you gone through uh, <laughs> the book and submitted to every single thing and and submitted again even if you don't think it's right to I'm seeing stuff in the tri-state area to contacting a local college or a local theater group or a theater troupe at a community college and say do you ever do new works do you want to do my play um, and just go for it, like lean in and full tilt boogie. And it's not gonna be fun or easy. And it's gonna take more work than probably actually writing your show. But I just throw that out there for something. I don't know if, um, but I'm a big fan of like the self-producing. And you're just like, but I don't know any actors or whatever. I'm like, then go to, again, like go to the junior college, go to the community college, go to uh, anybody and write them with a very specific thing and say, do you have a slot for this one act? Do you have a slot? It's out there. The resources are out there. And it, it kind of falls on us to just keep pitching our own stuff. Does that resonate at all or? I just wanted to, as I said, we hadn't really addressed the issue with some of these practicalities. Oh, yeah, sure. Right. I think the ten minute. That, I think the ten minute play has become really popular, partially because there are more festivals that are producing mm -hmm. ten minutes, and then you get introduced to more and more people. Yeah. I just throw that out there as a as a. Yeah. Could I can I throw my hat in here yes. too? Yes. Um, because I've actually had this experience as well, where uh, I feel like I've. I've done everything that I can, and I'm sort of still on like an outlier, and, 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 and it's a very, it's a, it's a very frustrating position to be in. Um, I, I'm only going to speak for myself, but I found that my solution to that was to actually be a lot more active in my community than I had been, hmm. um, which sounds very Yoda, and I don't mean it that way. I meant, I mean like, you know, I'm, uh, I'm part of the BMI workshop. I make an effort to see what I can do for that organization and for, for that organization's younger writers. Um, uh, having been a, a Guild Fellow here two years ago, um, I now help Seth, Seth Cotterman do social media for the fund. And we've live tweeted from you know, the, the, the gala every yeah. year. Like That alone does two things for me. The first thing it does is it takes me out of the equation again, which is constantly something that's, that I'm struggling with takes me out of the equation and it enables me to meet and see what everybody else is doing. That alone opens up a million other doors. People will remember, oh, he's the guy that just wants to serve. Let's just check this guy. It, it, it just, it, mm. it really shifts the paradigm. Um, and when you've like spent, you know, a year or two years working on this thing that you know is great, but mm. like you just can't get somebody to like pay attention, like 
now you have like five new friends who, who can help like with that. Um, the, the other thing that it does is uh, it, it, opens, it opened me up to younger uh, fledgling theater companies, right? And this goes back to what I was talking about before when I was applying for things about whether or not my ego would allow it. There are certain people like you go to like, you know, to the backstage or whatever and you see these acting companies and you're like, oh, that's just a dude just out of college who doesn't have anything, has have a job and he's a trust fund or whatever. But like <laughs> this generation's fledgling theater companies are next generation's MTC and roundabout. You know what I'm saying? They all start from somewhere. And do I as an older person like feel like it's inappropriate for somebody of my age or position or wisdom or knowledge or any of those things to, to work with somebody who's younger than me or less experienced? Or does that, is that, does that become a seed that I can plant? Um, and and uh, like there, there, for every example that I can think of where I've said yes, I've also said no. Um, but I feel like it took me a long time to realize that what was happening in terms of me thinking I was exhausting my, uh, my avenues was really me saying no to a lot of things that I should have been saying yes to. Mm -hmm. See, recognizing instead of opticals, opportunities, mm -hmm. you know, so that's, that's great, advice. Yeah. great advice. There was a question. Did you have oh, a question? Um, when show business is up in the rules and regulations, if you can't get here from there, it's impossible, except it's a green factory and you just make it happen anyway. And I have to spend a lot of years as a publicist. I was your publicist many years ago. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and from knowing the industry, I realized that the, I started writing plays when I was in my 50s. Hmm. But um, you have to ignore the rules and regulations and the industry because it will tell you no all the time. Right. And once you've experienced a sacred zone of making your own work, you will do anything to get in that room with those people mm -hmm. in those folding chairs, to get those whips, and actually wind up finding ways to self-produce. Mm -hmm. The John Charrington festivals, the Midtowns, all these little spaces, 10 minute mm -hmm. plays all over mm -hmm. the country. Once you've experienced it, it really is like crap. Mm -hmm. You'll do anything Absolutely. to get back in the room with those people and then wind up being um, on a stage with mm -hmm. people that you don't. Sometimes people that you don't know mm -hmm. yeah. seeing your show and getting yeah. reviews. Yeah. And even with all that, you go back to square one. And for, I was Blue Man's publicist for many mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we did that, I remember we did a 10 minute play festival yeah. and, uh, and, uh, at the source, yeah. And I, I started writing plays because I got really sick on my job. I had heart failure, then mm -hmm. went back to work, and I was a hero, then I had heart failure and brain damage. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to die, let me start writing plays again. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was a successful publicist. I knew, you know. You're emerging. You're not dead yet. Everything is good. Once you've seen the Reaper, it's all good. So I've, I've been plays every year. Wiped out my 401k producing them, but I'm doing them. Um, mm. But Amazing. I talked to Richard Foreman last year because Ben Brantley called me and said, what's Richard Foreman doing these days? And I said to Richard, what are, you, what are you doing? And he said, well, nothing, nothing much. He said, how are you? He asked me, well, how are my plays going? Well, wow, diary. <laughs> Richard Foreman asked me. He said, nobody, Richard Foreman, MacArthur winner, all these years in the business, said, oh, nobody wants my plays. Huh. So yeah. it's, it's a, a great level. Just yeah, we're fighting the good fight. Do your work, yeah. your jihadists never stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I love Definitely. that. Me yeah. too. Yes. Uh, alluded to this um, when you were speaking, and that is the issue of the day job. And um, you know, when you were asking um, what is your version of success, one of the versions of success that I that I kind of keep stored away is when I don't have to have a day mm -hmm. job anymore. But I, I <coughs> come to the realization that it's probably not. Good. And I'm, I've learned it's called having a hybrid career. Yeah. Um, but I just, I want to know um, what all of your experiences are at this point in your careers with uh, other types of work. Do you still resort to <coughs> other types of work? Mm -hmm. Income, how do you integrate that into work? And mm -hmm. what's your strategy for it? Could I please start? Just yes. because I feel like you all have better stories than me. <laughs> Um, I work 40 hours a week for an investment banking firm. I pay for my own health insurance, and I make a lot of copies. 
Um, but interesting of story. Your own, of your own stuff? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, you know. <laughs> they, they do. They, they that's do. Right. And that's part of the tacit They're understanding. They're benefactors, that's yeah, what I say. Yeah, exactly. And they always get a thank you in the program. They always do. <laughs> um, interestingly enough, I was having a conversation with uh, our friend J.G. Makapugai a couple of years ago, an actor. She, she's in Here Lies Love. She's, you know. Um, and she was saying, oh, I'm really excited about my new day job because I want something that's challenging and I want to not be bored at my work um, and I'm really looking forward to being able to balance that with auditions. And like, fast forward a couple months later, she was like, boy, my day job is really challenging and I have a lot of responsibility now and I can't get to my auditions. And I said, take note because that's exactly what you asked for, right? So what I asked for with my survival job was something where you hit the glass ceiling like on day three, <laughs> so that you know you get there, you do it, and you, you can commit to it. But when you leave those doors, you leave it behind, yeah, yeah. and you don't have to carry it with you. And um, and sometimes there's a lot there's crossover where they can help you. And it turns out um, my boss is married to a writer in one of my writing groups, and so like yeah, and I and I didn't know that before, but it, it just turned out to be this really like, circuitous, er, circuitous, fortuitous thing where. Um, I'm not afraid to ask for time off if I need it because they, he totally gets it. And, and, and anyways, that's, that's sort of where I'm at now. And uh, I spoke earlier about a, a successful day not rolling my eyes at somebody asking me why or what on Broadway I've written and having to say no. Well, something that I really, really like, I'm very proud of is when somebody asks me what I do without flinching, I say, well, what do I do to pay my rent or what's my career? Yeah. And it's just, a ma it's just a matter of fact because those are, it's, it's just like what you said. So that's where I'm at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, well, I packed book boxes for 10, 12 years of my life and wrote plays at night. And I've only recently transitioned into being a full-time writer, but I also supplement that with teaching and workshops and things. Um, so I say I am a teacher too, and use that to supplement income, mm -hmm. which is definitely needed, even with subsidiary right, um, mm -hmm. checks and things like that. And I also enjoy that teaching, it kind of fuels it. But I had to be, I had to check myself too a little bit about, um, again, comparing and contrasting to other people, or fantasy, that acquisitive mind, because I had for years of like, the perfect day, and like, that must be awesome. And I do think you have to be careful, or, or I always had to be, of equating that, that that meant I would be a better writer, or a different kind of writer, or be more productive. Um, and yeah, yeah, so I'm all for honesty in the day job, and there were days I'm like, this sucks, I don't wanna go to do this. But I did it, and I would do it again, and I may have to, and I'm like, there's no shame in the game, and we do what we gotta do. And you wake up an hour earlier before you go to the office, and you get some pages out, or you stay up a little later than you want to, and you know, uh, have a cup of coffee and get some more pages out. But I, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm always like, no shame in the game. You do whatever you can mm -hmm. do to make sure you have a little food, a roof over <laughs> your head, and you get to rock your art in, the, in between. Yeah. I would say that the writers at New Dramatist, I mean, I would 99.9% .9 have some other method of, of income or some other, um, a lot of it's teaching, um, a lot of it's television, they've uh, gone to television, but I would say that it's very few playwrights that I know make their living solely from writing or, or from, from the theater yeah. or the theater <laughs> productions and stuff because they're writing all the time and I think a lot of it is about the discipline of you know when is when do you write and how does that um, where does that fall within what else you have to do that day to mm -hmm. make sure that you have food and shelter mm -hmm. and things like that um, so I think that that's I, I think that would be a dream situation for many but I think it's not totally realistic you know and also, I like, I mean, I met a lot of people at my yeah. day job. It got me out. I got on the subway. All that influenced what I was writing. So I got to a point, too, I was like, careful what I wish for, too, because the, all of that struggle went into the art mm -hmm. and went into making what I wanted to say and influenced and, and got me out there and interacting. It was part of my artistic makeup. Well, it is this sort of that engagement is actually yeah. also the view of the world comes from outside that, mm -hmm. that fuels whatever you're writing. It makes me think, too, going back to your question, that so much of what is being echoed here, it's just also, you know, what are, what are the resources within your own community for, you know, support? I think about the foundation of New Dramatists was, 
you know, playwrights are each other's greatest resources. It was, the organization was founded by a playwright, four other playwrights, and ways to create community to support each other as they were trying to seek and find opportunities for production. So, um, you know, I think that there, what is, what is that potential too within, you know, your community or your uh, peers of other writers and what you can accomplish together, you know, to, to get the work out there to um, share that work too. So it's not just a sort of always being faced with a gatekeeper, which I think is enormously frustrating, you know, and demoralizing. Yeah. That's yeah. great advice. Yeah. Um, you, did you want to answer? Oh, you I did. Well, uh, it sounds like uh, it sounds like an uh, unlikely miracle, but I actually make most of my living as an actor. I don't know mm -hmm. how. I really don't. I, I honestly don't. But, um, I was no, just going to no, say. No, everyone's talented. Um, <laughs> television, I, television and, mm -hmm. and plays and, and then, yeah, so it's, it's a miracle. Um, <laughs> but I also, you know, I, and I say yes to everyone who calls me to do a reading. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, but I learned from it. I really, I really uh, love well, it. Well, that's because, an engagement thing. Too. Yeah, yeah. yeah, because I really, I meet uh, the other writers and, and uh there and just watch the new works being um, developed and and learn a lot from that whole process. Mm -hmm. So I consider that a part of my writing education as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, a couple of you have used the term voice in some of the discussion, and I'm just wondering if you could maybe talk about what that means to you. You know, if you found it, if you didn't find it, mm. how it did finding it change the way you work or mm. the kind of work that you produce. Where does the for you anyway, where did that choice come from? Well, um, I'm going to echo something that Hunter said earlier about <clears throat> asking myself what do I want to see that nobody else is, is writing or producing and then just doing that. Um, back when I was acting, I, I worked with a filmmaker who said the very, very same thing. And he didn't, <clears throat> he didn't ultimately make it as a filmmaker. But he's, he's always made it in my mind as an artist because he asked that question and he challenged me to ask that question. Um, but I'm sort of an odd bird just because the bulk of my work uh, in musical theater specifically involves uh, telling stories of people who look like me uh, that don't necessarily involve, you know, People that don't look like you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, the, the, the immigrant story. Like, well, when we think of like Asian Americans in theater, we think of the immigrant story. Right. Um, or the exotic story. And for my, for my money, those are two great stories, but there's like 15 million other ones that nobody else is writing. And that's sort of what I did. Um, and so given that that's what I elected to do, I found myself in a position where I didn't have any real mentors that could do that. I mean, some people wrote <laughs> stuff like that, but they weren't necessarily in musical theater. Um, others who, who didn't, who were writing as composer, lyricist, librettist, didn't, weren't particularly political. And so at one point I realized like, oh, I can just make it up as I go along, uh, which was so liberating because for me, like I'm the, mo I'm the most bankable, like academic, like you can teach me all the rules and I'll just play by them. <laughs> um, and like to just like, kind of think out, out of the box, I was like, oh, that's what everybody else has known all their lives that I didn't. Um, and and that, that's like, I think, part and parcel to, for, for me in, in figuring out what my voice was, is understanding that um, it doesn't, it isn't born from mimicry, and it isn't born from uh, being like necessarily, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, iterative, I guess, iterative, um, but innovative instead. And, mm -hmm. The end. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I guess my voice. I was saying, if it's coming from me, then it's my voice. Mm. Um, is mm. kind of what I've arrived at, and I don't know if that means I'm still kind of like searching. But if I had to land on a more sophisticated answer, um, I again, I write primarily musicals, and I love going to musical theater. But I always like, and I like big spectacle too. I'm like, what if musicals look like how we talk when we're at a coffee shop? And so that's kind of sometimes that influence that things that s seem more mundane, um, <laughs> if you blow it up into musicals, that always interests me to get me started of how we talk to each other on an elevator or, um, but I guess if it's, like I said, if it is coming from me, then that's my voice, I think. Mm. Yeah. 
And like when I mean coming like for real, coming for me and that stuff that you're always like, oh, I'm gonna cut this. That seems too weird. <laughs> like that actually is my voice. Wow. I found, yeah. and that's the thing. Like that that I was from nervous to put out there for some reason. I was like, mm -hmm. this is. No one will know what that means. It's either too specific or too whatever. I'm like, I think that actually is my voice, and I've learned that the easy way and the hard way too. When I've cut mm -hmm. it, I'm like, oh man, that was the good. Or when I kept it in, and it meant something or got the reaction that I th had hoped it would from people watching it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So all that stuff I'm gonna cut. <laughs> you know, I, um, I started writing because I was en encouraging my writer friends to <laughs> write. Yeah. It, literally, you know me, I'm, I'm mm. like this, uh, I, I like to gather people. So I, I was having these conversations with some writer friends who said, I just, I need to, I need someone to help push me a little. I need to, I need to have people there to. And so, great, I'm going to get together a room full of writers and directors and actors, and and we'll. We, we, and of course, I had to name it. Uh, it's the Collaborative Collective, and we're going to get together and help each other uh, create stuff and just keep going. And uh, then somebody said, "Well, what about you? Why aren't you writing something?" Well, I don't know how to. Write. Well, d why don't you try? And then I realized, oh, I have. I do have something that I really want to say. I, I started doing it, and but where my voice, I think, came out was when I realized I had things to say that weren't being said, and that I should still say it. You know, that to not try to fit into whatever the commercial mold was or what was expected. Uh, I can tell you, as an as an actor. Every, almost, I would say 99% of the new scripts that I read or audition for in co big commercial productions are about Asians from Asia, not Asian Americans. My, my family come, came here in 1852 for the first time. So, so you know, my experience is, is that, I think, you know, Asian American. And uh, when I started thinking, when I started writing, and I thought, oh, well, am I supposed to be writing what people want me to write, it was never good. And so I think once I was able to just own that, I'm gonna say what I wanna say, then I, I was able to unleash my own voice. And I don't think I could have done that at any other time than when mm -hmm. I did. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, that sounds a little obvious too, but. Um, I believe that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I have absolute profound respect and love for people who find their own individual voice. I also want to say a word for copying. <laughs> Recently, well for years I've been thinking, how did Shakespeare do it? Did he copy from the Greeks? How did he do it? A few Sunday nights ago, the Iliad was on television. Well, I've been working a lot <coughs> In a, in a beginning of the play, on Oprah, Moons of Fire, what it said in the brightest heaven. I'm just thinking how I did it. Sure enough, Shakespeare got that exactly <laughs> from the Odyssey about Homer. That's the way he started his play, <coughs> too. It was Oprah, Muse of Fire, oh, something or other. <laughs> so that's just one little word for a <laughs> well, so I think that I call it uh, but, uh, like yeah. inspiration yeah, or imitation. So I think, but if if it's funneled through you, it is your voice, and it can be inspired by Iliad, by Shakespeare, all those, and it'll be your voice if it's funneled through you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we have three minutes, so we have time for maybe one more question. Does anyone? Yes. Hi. Have you participated in the DG Huddle yet? 
because yeah. uh, and uh, that it's uh, it's a fantastic thing that 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 connects people across the country. Uh, they do it through Zoom or something like yeah. you have to be on your computer and and. And monthly, I think they have a conversation of different topics. So maybe this is a topic that um, I, I'm happy to suggest it to to them. I, I, none of us here work for for the guild, but but yeah, it's a that's a great that's it's a, a great, great start idea. to to be able to connect people that way. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, that's I guess that's thank it. Thank you. you so much thank for being you. with thank us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christine, and thanks, thanks Christine. to Dramatist Guild. Yes. Thank you all. It's so hot in here. It's hot. Oh, my God. <laughs> 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 what else? Ooh. Ooh. I, oh my